Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, so today we're going to cover customer relationship management and supply chain management. And you know last class we covered um, you know a lot of things with dealing with Excel. Uh, next class we'll also cover some more things with Excel so I'd encourage you to tune in. Uh, but for this class it's going to be talking about how uh, to effectively manage customer relationships as well as to effectively manage supply chains. Um, so the first thing I have here, if the uh, slide will go to the next slide, uh, we're going to cover a lot of different topics today. Uh, specifically on CRM, we're going to cover operational CRM, as well as various other types of CRMs that may be used. Uh, we're also going to cover uh, how IT may actually play a role in uh, supporting supply chain management. So normally we would play the video, um, however I don't want to get a copyright strike, so certainly it's a pretty entertaining little clip there, pretty short recommend that you watch it if you feel like it. If not, that's fine too. Um, so in general, you know, there's a couple main goals with customer relationship management. As the name suggests, uh, the first one of course is to effectively manage your customer relationships. It's very important to understand who your customer are, uh, who your customers are rather, and to better reach out to them with projects and uh, things they may be interested in, you know, new products, new services, things like that. So there's a couple key considerations to bear in mind uh, when you're doing that. And the first, of course, is going to be how long has a customer been with you? Now, uh, when I say customer age, that's what that's referring to. It's not referring to the age of the customer. Rather, it's referring to how long the relationship has been established between the firm and the customer. And then also, how much are they buying? So we have customer value. We have very high value customers. Those are customers that uh, really obtain quite a bit of... Uh, well, they are quite a large portion of our sales. Uh, so if we have a customer who maybe has been with us for 30 years, they may still not have a very high value in that they may have a very tiny portion of our sales. Maybe they only buy you know, a $1 product from us, whereas we have other customers who regularly make $30,000 purchases. Um, you know, that's what customer value refers to. And you know, when you do this, it's very important that you reach out to the customers in a way that they uh, prefer. So, for example, some people prefer uh, getting physical mail. Other people hate physical mail. Um, so you give them the preference as to how you'd reach out to them. And that's really where permission marketing kind of comes into this whole uh, discussion. So you also want to have uh, personal marketing. And the whole point of personal marketing is to form relationships uh, with your customers. So you would know things about the customers, maybe you make notes inside the CRM regarding them. Uh, maybe if they have kids, you'd make notes about their kids. Maybe if they're into a hobby, you'd make notes about the hobby. Um, just stuff like that to have a better relationship with the customer. And of course the goal of this is customer intimacy. And when we refer to customer intimacy, that's referring to being close to their customers. Um, that's the type of intimacy that is. Not to be confused with any other type of intimacy. Uh, so the whole process with customer relationship management is quite simple. And this isn't even necessarily a process. Instead, it's just a diagram to kind of explain who our customers are. So at the very outer ring here, this is the general population of people who could be a customer of ours. As we move closer and closer to the center, we reach various levels of customers. So then outside of the target population, uh, really within the target population of potential customers, we have actual customers. So the actual customers are people who have in the past purchased a product or service from us. Doesn't mean they're a repeat customer. However, some subset of the customers will be repeat customers. So we have loyal repeat customers next. And then we have high value repeat customers as well as low value repeat customers within our repeat customers. So basically what that's doing is that's segmenting the population all the way from people who could be a customer to people who are a very high value repeat customer. And you know what's interesting here is that in between customer and loyal repeat customer, we have lost customers. Those are customers who have uh, ceased pr purchasing products or services from us and instead now purchase them from a competitor. So let's take a quick look at this uh, customer relationship management to see how we go from a potential customer to a customer to a loyal repeat customer. So first you acquire a customer and you can do that in several ways. You could reach out to them uh, via marketing campaign. Uh, maybe they also reach out to you um, seeking a better product, seeking a better service, seeking a better price. Whatever you have to offer, 
you either reach out to them or they reach out to you. Either way, they acquire, they get acquired and they become a customer. So to go from a customer to a loyal repeat customer, typically you'd want to do uh, very good customer support or very good prices, something that makes them want to stick with you. If they don't want to stick with you, you'll lose them in customer churn. Um, that's something we're gonna talk about in a little bit here. And then after that, once they're a repeat customer, you segment them and you see, are they high value repeat customer or are they low value repeat customer? Both are important, but certainly if you had limited resources to reach out to your customers, you'd probably prefer reaching out to the high value repeat customers. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, do feel free to drop them in chat. I'm gonna keep going. Um, so, you know, the whole concept is that you want to contact them in some way. And whenever you contact them, that's referred to as a touch point because that's where you're in a sense, touching the customer. Um, I'm not physically touching, of course, but you're forming some contact with them. And this can be done in a lot of different ways. It's not uncommon for businesses to send out a lot of mailings, you know, to try to entice people to enter a store, maybe entice people about a new uh, product or service they're offering, and forming the customers. Also, if you have a repeat customer, maybe you shoot them off a quick phone call, see how they're doing, um, maybe offer them a deal if you haven't heard from them in a while and just kind of touching base with them. Um, instant messaging uh, is quite often used for things like product support. Um, some people prefer it because you know the waiting they can do other things more easily than a phone call. Other people don't prefer it. Um, just kind of depends on what you are into with that kind of thing. Uh, also websites. Websites of course are very useful uh, for conveying information. Uh, for also having information input, for doing things like e-commerce. It's really a very beneficial thing. And then there's a whole multitude of other customer, uh, you know, touch points that you could do through marketing campaigns, you know, advertisements, promotions, all that sort of thing are ways you can reach out to your customers. That's all this is referring to. So, you know, if we don't do these things well and we don't do them effectively and our product is poor and there's a lot of problems, we may face customer churn. Now, customer churn is whenever a customer leaves us, as we've described, but in some cases, a customer can't leave. So, uh, for example, if we're an industry that has very high switching costs, maybe we're the only provider um, of a good or service within a geographic area, we have a geographic monopoly, that's certainly possible, where even if we're, uh, we have these bad practices, we may still not see very much customer churn. Uh, perfect example of this, if you get mad at your, um, let's say Starkville Electric, for example, if you get mad at them, you, you don't really have a choice but to continue to get their service. Um, I guess you could uh, have a well and you know a septic system and um, do your own trash collection, I guess, and also do solar, uh, but that's not really feasible for most people, especially within the city limits. So if you're, uh, you may not be able to always churn inside of every single example. Um, so, you know, the, but you'll also likely see customer dissatisfaction. Regardless if you decide to leave the firm or not, you know, decide to quit being the customer, you're probably gonna be dissatisfied if they're um, having these bad practices. And also that can cause reputational damage. Now, as we think about reputation, uh, that's certainly an intangible asset. It's very difficult to put a value on customer reputation but there is, uh, there are certainly ways to do so. Um, you know, as we see what are people willing to pay in excess of something's worth, that's reputation. In other words, you know, we have a product or service and we're selling that product or service. What markup are you willing to pay? That's one way to calculate it. If you think about a stock, what are you willing to pay over book value? That's reputation. It's goodwill. Um, it's all the same thing. Uh, at least a very similar thing. I don't want to, you know, get any uh, accounting arguments or anything like that. But in general, that's what your reputation is. It's a very intangible asset, but it still is an asset. Um, so one of the things we can do with an effective CRM is through data consolidation. As we talked about in the data management chapter, we want to reduce redundancy. Redundancy can cause a lot of problems. It makes us, A, purchase more um, storage, it also makes the possibility that we may have um, problems if we want to change something. We, we could only change it in one place if we don't have redundancy, whereas if we do have redundancy, we may have to change it in thousands, hundreds of thousands, 
maybe even millions of different places. That takes a substantial amount more processing power to accomplish. And it also, if we're only changing in a handful of places, we may miss one or two. And that can cause inaccurate records. Inaccurate records, of course, are a very big problem for any data management uh, situation because you have information that is not correct. And that could lead you to send out a mailer and not actually have it re reach the recipient, or even worse, send out a product and have it not reach the recipient. So we want to make sure we don't have any inaccurate records. And also, we want to consolidate uh, all of our data into one single place and remove any sort of information silos. Just as a recapitulation, uh, we have a data silo as a silo in which only one functional unit is able to access the information as opposed to it being uh, available to the entire organization. So I'm just glancing over to make sure there's no questions or comments. I'm certainly happy to address them as I go. Uh, but for now, let's talk about a very specific type of operational or a very specific type of CRM, which is the operational CRM. And the whole purpose of an operational CRM is really to help the front of house with doing their regular functions. So when we think of a CRM, this is probably the type of CRM we, we generally think of. Just a kind of general CRM where we have all of our customer information and all that sort of stuff input. And when we talk about front of house, we're of course talking about our sales team. We're talking about marketing. We're talking about customer service. Uh, those are the people who are you know, more inclined to interact directly with customers than say our back of house, you know, our product team and maybe our logistics team. Those are less likely to interact directly with our customers. So that's the main distinction there. And there's two major uh, components to any sort of operational CRM. That's going to be customer facing and customer touching. Now as the name suggests, um, the distinction between customer facing and customer touching is whether or not the customer directly interacts with the system or if they go through an intermediary. And we'll talk more about that in a couple slides, so don't worry too much about it for now. But in general, customer facing is facing the customer such that they interact with an intermediary, whereas customer touching is done in a way to where the customer directly interacts with the system. So that's the main distinction. And as we think about some of the benefits behind this, we're able to have uh, marketing that's going to more readily and more um, easily relate to each and every customer. So we can actually do personalized strategies for our marketing. And that can be very good because if you have a, a customer who is only interested in one tiny aspect of your company, then you only reach out to them regarding that one tiny aspect. If you have a customer who's interested in a different aspect, they may not be interested in the other. So for example, let's say that we are a local, um, a local oil change place. And let's say that we want to reach out to all of our customers. We have all their customer information. Let's just assume we do. And we know that some customers only get the very basic oil change. So maybe we only reach out to them regarding uh, their basic oil change. Maybe we also have other services we provide that other customers really like. So we reach out to them regarding that. And the whole goal here with having all this data is to really be able to better understand your customers. And in some sense, you have a 360 degree view of each customer. Now what that means is that we have tons of information and tons of data regarding each customer. We have their transaction history. Uh, we have some of their contact information. Maybe we took notes over the customers. Uh, and maybe we also purchased some other um, data from a data broker regarding uh, potential customers. We have all that inside of a single place. That's the operational CRM. So we of course have the complete customer history and the whole goal behind all this is to improve our sales. Because as we improve our sales, we'll improve our profit. And what I mean by that is that if we can sell more, we will have more profit. If we're not doing that, then uh, we're not doing a, a very good job. Because if we increase our sales and we don't increase our profits, that's not really a very effective thing. In general, as our sales increase, our profit will increase. Now, depending on our industry, that could also improve our profitability, as I have on the slides here. But not every single industry will see that. Uh, for example, if we are doing, um, let's say we're a retailer, 
you know, in general, uh, we will have some fixed costs. So we will still see improved profitability, but we'll see less improved profitability than if we were, say, a service industry like a, um, let's say, a medical field. As we improve our sales, we will directly improve profitability because, in general, we're going to keep the same fixed cost in both cases. So fixed cost plus variable cost are really what determines how much your profitability will improve. Um, certainly, let me know if there's any questions as we go. Uh, but as we said before, you know the customer-facing applications are s applications that are going to, or even just components that are going to interact indirectly with customers. So one of the most common examples of this is going to be a customer interaction center. And a customer interaction center is basically kind of a modern term for a call center. Now, some people might disagree with that, but in a sense, that's what a call center is. It's a place in which customers contact to receive support. And what this is, a customer interaction center, it has a call center, but it also has uh, email, maybe instant messaging responses, basically just a modern call center. <laughs> you know, like I say, you could split hairs about it in general. Just know CIC is always going to be a call center. Um, and, you know, again, you know, you've gone into practice, a call center is a call center. People probably haven't heard of a customer interaction center. That said, do know what it is. Uh, and, you know, one of the uh, benefits of this is we can actually automate a lot of the kind of mundane uh, Salesforce tasks. For example, recording sales history. Um, you know, we can do that automatically. You know, as a customer makes a sale, we automatically record the sales history. Uh, same thing with storing customer information and also any potential sales leads we may have. All this is done and it allows us to have a more uh, complete view of our market. Uh, this contrasts a little bit with customer touching applications. As we said, a customer touching application is where the customer directly interacts with the system without interacting with an intermediary, which is often an employee, but it doesn't have to be an employee. And this is going to be known as eCRM, in other words, electronic uh, CRM. And, you know, really think about any CRM, it's probably going to be an electronic CRM. But just know that's what it's called as eCRM. So when we think about this, this is going to be something where the customer is going to be able to seek out help any time of day, any day of the week. And it's going to be done, them doing, uh, kind of searching online, uh, maybe looking for things, specific things, self-help type deal. Uh, and you know, a great example of this, of course, is going to be any web store. You know, Amazon.com, that's a great example of this. eBay, uh, these are all great examples where you can go, you can uh, certainly select which products or services you want, get information about them via self-help features, you know, things like product specifications, frequently asked questions, product reviews, and add them to your little buggy. Of course, it's an electronic buggy. And you can then check out and, you know, decide where you want to ship the things. So that's what a customer touching application is. The customer themselves are doing that. Uh, so some good considerations. Let me grab my water right quick. Okay, sorry about that. So, you know, one of the most basic things is to make sure that customers can find the information themselves. And we talked in an earlier chapter about doing that via tagging, making sure that we had things that are going to aid in the ability to search and find information very rapidly. So we want to have good searching algorithms. We also want to make sure we have good practices where we tag things with what they are. So that's very important. And we want to customize the experience. So if they sign into the account, they see things that they've maybe liked in the past. They see uh, kind of other things regarding that, maybe things they might like based on what other people like. So for example, let's say that we have, um, we're an online retailer and we have a lot of customers who purchase various things. Well maybe we found that customers who purchase things like a hammer also purchase things like a nail. So if we had a customer just bought a hammer, maybe we suggest they buy a nail. That's a customized experience. Uh, having frequently asked questions, that can really save you a lot of time and having to repeat the same uh, answers repeatedly. So let's say that we're a bank and we get asked a lot, how do I transfer money? So we have a frequently asked questions section where people can ask, how do I transfer money? And when they do that, 
Uh, we can also use, of course, automated responses like a chat bot to actually do that for us. This is quite common in the finance industry uh, because it's a very cost-effective way for a customer to get quick and easy assistance, whereas, you know, they don't have to wait on hold. Um, our representatives can do other things. It's very beneficial. So frequently asked questions, automated responses, very beneficial for this uh, task. And we may also consider doing some sort of a loyalty program where we do cash back. Uh, maybe we do other promotions. Um, these are going to be a lot more common, I would say, in the physical retail space. But, you know, certainly in some cases we would see loyalty programs in uh, online web stores as well. So it just kind of depends on what you're after and what you're seeking. Okay, let's talk a little bit about other types of CRM systems. So the on-demand CRM system uh, contrast, I would say, a little bit. Uh, the book says it contrasts a lot, but it, really the only difference is this is one that's going to be hosted via a third party. Probably done by us, some uh, software as a service, as opposed to something we're locally hosting. So it's not a huge difference, and you know, in practice, it can be the same exact piece of software as a traditional operational CRM. It's just a matter of where it's hosted. Uh, mobile CRM is a CRM that is going to have a great mobile interface and emphasize using mobile technologies to access it. Um, again, that's not very different. Uh, a lot of traditional uh, CRMs have certainly incorporated things like mobile applications, mobile websites, to make the experience better for salespeople on the go. Um, Again, I don't think it's very much different. Open source CRM is just a matter of having an open source license associated with it, such that you can review the code. Doesn't mean it'll be free. Often they will be free, um, because if you can review the code, it means you could also compile the code and run it yourself. But if you did that, you wouldn't receive any service associated with it. So it's not uncommon to have you know some minor issues and stuff that needs to be resolved with any sort of application, especially when you're talking about enterprise applications that's where the support contract really comes in and would be uh, pretty beneficial. And then lastly we have listed up there social CRM. That's basically just a CRM that emphasizes a lot of social components. Again they pretty much all emphasize social components now so um, again I'm probably not going to put any questions on the exam regarding these other types of CRM. Do know what they are, um, kind of know how they're distinct but I don't really think they're that distinct to be honest with you. Um, seems like they're They've all kind of morphed into one CRM now. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about supply chains. So in general, a supply chain is simply the kind of, um, it's kind of a representation of how a product goes from raw materials to a finished good that you consume. So that's pretty much the whole idea behind supply chain. And often, you know, it's not uncommon to see people on LinkedIn or wherever uh, describing their job as a supply chain manager. And that's not really true. Um, you know, to manage an entire supply chain is pretty uncommon. There's really only two cases in which that can happen. Um, the first being a command economy, which is where the government is the uh, pretty much only person, uh, well, it's not even a person, the only entity that manages, you know, any sort of private production. Um, and that's not very common. Uh, and then the other case would be digital distribution. So, for example, Apple has their App Store. Um, they make uh, apps and they distribute them through the App Store. They could be a supply chain manager uh, because they control how the uh, application is developed. They control how it's distributed. They control how it's sold. They control how it's supported. So they control each and every aspect of that supply chain. That's pretty rare. It's pretty uncommon. Typically, you control some part of the supply chain. So often instead of a supply chain manager, you're actually more like a uh, some sort of a process manager, maybe a um, maybe a production manager, something like that, uh, where you're not necessarily managing the entire supply chain. That's pretty rare. Uh, we also have uh, the concept of supply chain visibility, and that's a very important concept within supply chain because, you know, as what just said, you don't control the entire supply chain; you only control a tiny part of the supply chain. You know, if you're a store owner, you control retail. If you're a distributor, you control the distribution. But you don't control the entire thing. You don't control the raw materials, unless you're the raw materials uh, supplier. So, you know, you have some concept of the supply chain that you control. And the whole idea is that visibility is the concept of how much information 
from other aspects of the supply chain is available to other aspects of the supply chain. So for example, let's say we are a uh, retailer. Can we see how much raw materials our supplier has? Can we see that? Maybe we can, that's pretty high visibility. Maybe we can't, that could be a little bit lower visibility. Uh, also, could our wholesaler see that information? You know, so in general, we would expect the visibility from one party to the very next party on the supply chain to be much higher than, say, the, the end of the supply chain, which is going to be the ultimate uh, customer, or I guess consumer would actually probably come after customer, all the way down to our tier three supplier. So that's pretty much the whole concept of visibility, is how much information is shared across the various components. And then lastly, we have inventory velocity. That is to say, how fast is information, or not inf information, but how fast is inventory actually turned over across the supply chain? Is it very slow, or is it very rapid? You know, we think about a perishable good, uh, particularly um, things that are, quote, organically grown, to where they don't have a lot of preservatives or any sort of, uh, you know, modifications to them that allow them to have a longer shelf life, does have a very rapid inventory velocity. Whereas we think about something that's pretty much not perishable, not going to go bad, eh, you can have a much slower velocity and be fine. So the whole purpose is you want to avoid having any sort of waste inside the supply chain. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at a supply chain. This is generic supply chain. Uh, you know, we're probably familiar with the manufacturer. The manufacturer is the uh, person who's going to assemble various components into a finished product. Then they're going to sell it to a distributor or wholesaler, and who will then sell it to a retailer, and then it's going to be purchased by customers, and it's going to be, so this is not on here, but it's going to be ultimately consumed by a consumer. So a customer and a consumer are not necessarily the same party. Often they are, but they're not always. Uh, you think about, you know, uh, who actually ends up consuming a product is often going to be the person who purchases a product, but not always. Particularly when we're talking about business-to-business -business transactions. Uh, you may have a technology department who ultimately purchases the equipment, they're your customer, but they're not always the actual user. Uh, think about, for example, Canvas. Canvas is purchased via our IT department. You know, we purchase a license to use it and to have it provided to us, software as a service application. But ultimately, our IT department's not really the one using it. The actual consumer is students and faculty. So that's one example. Okay, let's go ahead and start at the very beginning here, where we have suppliers. So as we have a tier one supplier, that's gonna be very close to the finished good. But a tier two supplier is gonna be a little bit further from the finished good. And then a tier three supplier is gonna be even further from that. So let's use a product of a cell phone. Let's say we're a cell phone manufacturer. So we may actually purchase various supplies to assemble a cell phone. These supplies could be things like a, a processor, a screen, a digitizer, battery, all those sorts of things. We purchase each of those components, we put them together, we're the manufacturer, we're purchasing those products from a tier one supplier. So it's almost ready to go. But not quite, we gotta assemble it basically. That's what we're doing. So a tier one supplier, people who sell us the batteries, people who sell us the um, the phone, or not the phone, the, the uh, let me back up a little. They're selling us the batteries, they're selling us the screen, you know, all those sorts of components. They purchase components to make those. So maybe they purchase finished uh, PCB. Maybe they purchase things like capacitors. Maybe they purchase things like uh, processors. And they're going to purchase those from a tier two supplier. So they're making uh, pretty much finished parts, but the tier two suppliers are the ones who are creating smaller components that go on to a tier one's uh, part. So the tier two supplier would purchase things like um, silicon. They would purchase things like uh, maybe clean room equipment, stuff like that from a tier three supplier. So the tier three supplier has much more raw and unprocessed goods than our tier two supplier. A tier two supplier has much more raw and unprocessed goods than a tier one supplier. The manufacturer ultimately puts all of those together in a single product. So again, kind of going back to our example of a cell phone manufacturer, we talked about them purchasing uh, you know, things like silicon from tier three, things like um, capacitors from tier two, 
and things like uh, screens, uh, maybe completed boards, you know, things like that from tier one. Let's use another example here, because that may not be that clear to some people. Let's use a car. So we're a car manufacturer. Uh, we're going to purchase things like, um, maybe we purchase airbags from a tier one supplier. Maybe we purchase windshields, cloth seats, or any type of seat. Uh, we're purchasing parts we can easily assemble into a car from tier one suppliers. The tier one supplier is going to take the uh, things from the tier two supplier. So, for example, the tier two supplier may supply the chemicals used for the uh, airbags. They may supply um, the fabric used for the seats. Uh, they may also supply um, some of the type of sand used for the windshield. So if we go back another step, the tier three supplier would supply things used to make those components. So cloth, uh, you know, whatever is used to make cloth, I'm assuming some sort of maybe synthetic fiber is used. Maybe they're uh, supplying cotton. Um, you know, kind of going back to glass, we talked about how they're going to be, um, we already talked about tier two doing the sand. I'm not sure you could go back another layer from sand. Um, maybe you can. I'm not an expert on glass making. But you kind of get the point. As you go back a layer or a tier, you get to less and less processed goods. Okay, so then we got the manufacturer where the pe people actually, whoops, I clicked. Didn't mean to click there. We have the people actually, um, you know, putting everything together into a finished product, then we sell it wholesale often, and you know, the distributor. Um, those aren't always the same, but in this example they are. I think it's probably a little bit more simple for them to be the same. Um, sells it to a retailer, the retailer ultimately sells it to a customer. Uh, is that pretty clear to everyone? Let me know if there's any questions. Uh, but you know, what we have is we have uh, things going upstream that's going to our suppliers, going from our customer to our suppliers. We also have information going downstream. That is information going from the suppliers to our customers. So we think about things that are going up the supply chain. It's going to be things like orders, um, where a customer orders something, or a retailer orders something, or a distributor order. You get the point. Um, information. So information actually goes both ways. Customer is going to give information if there's a problem. The supplier is going to give information about you know quantities, prices, all that's going to be done. Uh, payments, of course, will go from customer all the way down to the tier three suppliers, and also any sort of product returns that need to take place. Um, that will often go back to the manufacturer if it's a problem with a component that they assembled. Maybe it'll go back to a supplier. Uh, we don't know, but in general, you know, returns will go back from the customer to the manufacturer. Uh, then we look at what's going. Of course, we have products and services that are going up as well as information. Uh, so let me know if there's any questions about this. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm happy to go back if I need to, though. Uh, so, you know, the whole purpose uh, behind any sort of supply chain management, you know, we want to deliver goods and services at a cost effective rate. And we do this, of course, by making sure that we're aligned with our organization's goals. So let's go ahead and go through the different steps of supply chain management. And of course, as you may uh, guess, as many other things are, this is a cycle. This is something that's done over and over and over to ensure we have a steady flow of goods and services. So the first thing we do is we plan. We see what does our strategy say we should do. You know, based on that, we determine what good or service we should sell. We determine how we're going to acquire the things, what we need to acquire, um, how we're going to assemble it, whatever we're doing, we're going to go ahead and plan it out before we actually do anything. Once we've got a pretty solid plan, and this is going to be done at strategic level, uh, tactical level, and also operational level. This is uh, going to involve a lot of different parts of the organization. We actually then go and acquire the things we need. That's where we source them. Once we've done that, we go through and we actually make what we need to make. So we've got our raw parts, we're going to put them together into something we can sell. Or if, you know, whatever we're doing. So if we're a tier three supplier, maybe we go harvest sand, you know, we grab a shovel or whatever equipment we use, we load up uh, however we're going to ship the material, and that's, that's where we make, basically. So to source, if we're a supplier, maybe we source some land that has some sand on it. 
Uh, again, I'm not an expert on sand, but you kind of get the point there. Uh, then we actually deliver it. So we have our good or service, we actually go forth and we take it to the customer. However we do that, maybe we ship it via uh, ground, maybe we uh, use a train, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then lastly, we handle any sort of return or any sort of customer support. So let's kind of go through each of these a little bit more, specifically deliver. So there's a lot of different ways we could deliver a good or service. Um, of course, we could do it electronically if it is uh, suitable for that. For example, software uh, used to be you'd purchase it on a, some sort of a uh, disk media. Nowadays, you probably just download it. Uh, and that can be beneficial because it's a very cost effective way and it also is a way in which in most cases, a vast majority of cases, you don't have to worry about a physical supply being limited. Uh, for example, you know, if you walked into a computer store in the 90s, um, you may not be able to purchase a copy of Microsoft Office. They may have run out. Whereas nowadays, you can just uh, purchase it online and download it. Uh, it's going to be much more cost effective for the um, for the manufacturer because they don't then have to manufacture a physical product anymore. Uh, so that's one way we could certainly deliver. We could also use trains. Uh, you know, going back to the sand example, that could very well be a very cost-effective way to deliver sand. You know, in general, if you could put something on a train, it's going to be cheaper than putting it in the back of a semi. You know, just kind of uh, in general, if you can. A lot of raw material, uh, coal is probably transported that way. Uh, other sorts of minerals and soil often going to be transferred via train because it's an effective way to move large quantities of material at a, you know, you don't have to move it very quickly, it's not perishable. So that's another way we could do it. Um, semi trucks, very useful for getting things in a lot of different places that maybe a train can't go. So maybe for the last mile, uh, so to speak, you could use a train or you could use a semi to deliver from a train station. Probably would be more than a mile, I imagine. Uh, most people are not within one mile of a train station. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of different ways you could uh, transfer your good. Also things like pipelines. If the material flows, then you could probably transfer it pretty cost effectively via pipeline. Um, you know, think about things like oil, um, gas, um, those are often transferred via pipeline. Not always, but a lot of cases they will be. Um, also water, certainly uh, very transmissible via pipeline, uh, but some things that aren't transmissible via pipeline, uh, things like um, toothpaste, pudding, um, that's an example from a Dilbert clip I think is maybe in this slide or a different slide. Uh, kind of a humorous joke there, uh, you know, you can't transfer every single thing through a pipeline. I'm getting a little bit off track though. So the whole purpose of this is to have some kind of way that an organization can think from the planning phase all the way down to handling any sort of customer service. And this is of course uh, viable to any of these different components other than maybe customer, where they're going to have this process. If we're a retailer, we determine what goods or services we're going to sell, and then we determine where we actually then acquire those goods or services. Uh, make, I guess, is whenever we would put them out for customers to go purchase. Uh, deliver would be allowing customers into the store, or, you know, in modern day, maybe we do some sort of drive through, maybe we do some sort of online delivery, whatever the case may be. And then lastly, we handle any sort of return or other service issues that may arise. So that's for any of these different things. We're going to have a process that's very similar to this. Uh, may not match it exactly, but in most cases, it'll be pretty uh, related. Okay, so the overall goals of supply chain management, of course, are to effectively get good and service out uh, very cost effectively. So we want to make sure that any sort of good or service, we want to have uh, a lower cost than our competitors in a lot of cases, or we want to be able to get a new product or service out to them quicker. Whatever we're striving for, we can accomplish it via uh, effective supply chain management and effective production management. And one of the ways this is done is through an interorganizational information system. That is to say that an information system that is not just associated with one single uh, organization, it's associated with multiple organizations. 
So maybe your different suppliers here share it, maybe your manufacturers and distributors and wholesalers all share one inner organizational information system. And that can be very beneficial for us because that's going to do a lot of things for us. First thing it's going to do is it's going to reduce the cost of a transaction. Because we all share a system, we don't have to then have the information flowing between different systems. It's all inside of a system. You order something, you get billed for it, and it also goes ahead and takes the, the money out of whatever accounts are associated with it. That greatly reduces the transaction cost. You can also make sure that the information that is flowing uh, between the different organizations is better information because we have uh, you know, we have our supply in there, we have our supplier supply in there. This is all information that we all share. Can also make the cycle time smaller. So we think about a cycle, and a cycle, of course, is going from the supply to the customer. So that's basically the cycle. We want to make sure that's as short as possible because that way we are more effectively utilizing our capacity. Uh, we also want to make sure we eliminate paper records using an uh, interorganizational information system. Uh, paper records are something that are very costly and they're also very difficult to find what you're looking for in. You know, you think about if you had a small store, paper records are probably perfectly fine. Uh, however, if you contrast that with a very large business, paper records are nearly impossible to find what you're looking for. I'm not saying that you couldn't, I'm just saying it would take you a substantial amount of resources in terms of you know organizing things to where you're able to find them. It's just a lot easier without paper. Um, also paper records are bad because they're difficult to have backups of. So let's say that you had an organization that suffered a fire or suffered a flood or suffered anything that made the paper records inoperable. You then lose out on uh, having a record of what you did or what you sold and that can be very problematic from many perspectives. You think about from a fraud perspective, you think about from a tax perspective, think about from um, you know all sorts of different perspectives. It's very good to have records of what you did. And also, if you don't, you could miss out on uh, potential sale opportunities. And then lastly, of course, it's gonna help simplify information processing. So if you have all the information in one place, it's very easy to process. So let's talk about some of the different uh, problems this can help solve, or some of the different ways that supply chains can uh, make our products and services more cost effective. So the first is going to be vertical integration. Vertical integration, of course, is the whole principle of you know, uh, getting more parts of the supply chain. So if we have control over our suppliers and over our distributors, we have more vertical integration. Uh, Just-in-time inventory, of course, is where we take, um, we basically wait as long as possible to produce a good or service. So, for example, let's say we're a restaurant. If we prepare everything in advance, we may end up throwing out a substantial portion of food. However, let's say that we instead um, use just-in-time practices, and we don't make or buy anything until we get an order. Um, that could be something that's very beneficial because then we're not wasting nearly as much inventory. Now that said, you'd probably still have to purchase some inventory, but the degree to which you prepare it could still be uh, benefited using just-in-time inventory. Uh, information sharing, we just kind of talked about that, you know, making sure that various aspects of the supply chain all share the same information. That can greatly reduce waste, it can greatly uh, improve the um, speed at which products and services are delivered. And then lastly, there's the concept of using vendor managed inventory. Uh, this is quite common in certain industries, particularly uh, some of the food industries, um, often done via consignment. So consignment meaning that the vendor uh, actually owns the product or service and the, they merely rent out the space from the store. Uh, it's very common in the bread industry, for example, where you actually see the bread uh, being delivered via uh, bread um, manufacturer, bread distributor rather. So they actually own the bread and it's to their interest that they only purchase the bread that will be sold before it expires. Okay, let's talk about how IT can actually play a role in this. So there's three major ways and these are all pretty interrelated. Uh, one of the main ways is to have some sort of electronic data interchange established between the various aspects of the supply chain. So we could do this through 
uh, you know, as we just talked about, an organizational information system. That's one way we could accomplish this goal. We could also, of course, do this through an extranet where we have a specialized network where maybe we're sharing files, maybe we're sharing invoices, whatever sort of information we're sharing, we can exchange more than just raw data. We can actually exchange files through an extranet. And we could also do the same via portal and exchange. That's gonna be where we kind of have it more along the lines of a website. So for example, my state is a portal to a lot of different uh, Mississippi state services. That's one example of a portal. We could also do that for, if we were a firm, to do that for our industry. You know, extranets are often uh, used to exchange information across an industry. Um, maybe it's done to exchange information in other ways, but that's certainly kind of what we would do there. So just kind of recap, we talked about a lot of different things with CRM, uh, specifically the operational CRM, and we also talked about how to effectively manage supply chains. Uh, let me know if there's any questions. And uh, while I'm waiting on that, like I said, there is about a 15 second delay. I do want to remind you that if you want to uh, talk instead of using chat, I'll hop inside of the Microsoft Teams page and you can chat in there. I'll be there for about 15 minutes. Um, if no one shows up, I'll head out. If not, I'll stick around uh, inside of that and answer any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, so I will stick around just a minute here. And if there's no questions, uh, certainly I hope you all have a great day. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hop over the teams. So I hope you all have a great day.